It's all right. How's everybody doing tonight? Well, we're really glad you're here. If you're visiting with us tonight here at Destiny Generation, we are so pumped that you're here. Uh, man, it's just, uh, we, we just pray that God will touch your heart, move in your life tonight. Um, so anyways, let's pray one more time and we'll dive into words. Sound good with y'all? Yes, no? Are y'all with me tonight? Yes? Look, I'm ready to preach, so I hope you guys are with me tonight, okay? Yeah. If you can, just tell your neighbor, say, listen up. Good deal. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for your word, Lord. We know that you said, God, that it is uh, alive and powerful, Lord, that it's sharper than any two-edged sword. So, Father, tonight, God, we pray that your sword, the sword of the Spirit, would come in this room tonight. Father, we thank you, God, that, that in this room, God, that we are hungry, God, that we just don't hear your word and go, well, that's an old. But, Lord, we thank you that we hear it tonight, God, and we mix it with faith, Lord, and it will produce, God, that which you sent it to accomplish in our hearts. So, Father, tonight, God, we come with eager anticipation, God, of all that you desire to say to us. In Jesus' name, Father, thank you for your presence. Thank you for your anointing. Amen. Amen. Well, look, I'm going to take a little bit more time to set this up, but uh, I feel feel the need to do so. But So, anyways, let me go and tell you this. Probably my first two years of salvation, I, I had the great privilege uh, to visit a church that uh, on several occasions that had a genuine, a genuine revival happening there. And uh, let, let me maybe uh, make something clear. Who, who's heard the word revival before? No? Okay. So, so you're not misunderstanding what I'm saying. Uh, I, what I went to was not a, uh, you know, a special meetings that some uh, church leadership team decided to get together with a guest speaker and put on a, uh, you know, basically a week of special meetings. What, I, what I'm talking about tonight could only be explained as this, as a supernatural outpouring of God's power in his presence. In fact, let me kind of give you a, a few things that kind of marked this revival that I had the opportunity to go to. Uh, you, you know, a lot of times when the first revival we talked about, it'll happen basically for three, four, five days. This revival actually happened for eight years. So basically it started and continued for eight years. And over those eight years, basically millions of people came. If it was in, you know, cars, vans, buses, airplanes, millions of people came from all around the world. And what was so crazy about this, and once again, I experienced this, people would literally wait in line for hours on end. In fact, I remember one of the times I went, I went to talk to the guy that was in front of the line. I said, what time did you get in line this morning? He says, 7 o'clock. Doors didn't open until 6 p.m. He got there at 7 a.m., so anyway, so basically, literally, they would wait in line just in hopes that they would get in the, biz, uh, in the building. Uh, literally, out of those millions of people, hundreds of thousands, get that number, hundreds of thousands of people uh, gave their life to Jesus. They gave their life to Jesus, and they were water baptized. And even, uh, you, you know, I don't even know the number of people that were baptized in the Spirit. I don't know the number of people that got healed. How many people had, uh, you, you know, basically an intervention of God in their life, some miracle took place. But... But there was one thing that kind of marked this revival, and it was this, that night after night after night, when the altar call was given, a majority of the people would get out of their seats, and hear me, they would not walk, but they would run to the altar and dive in the altar, bury their face in the carpet, and they would begin to weep and sob in repentance before the Lord. And uh, some people, literally, when they got down there, the power of God would hit them so hard that they would literally shake uncontrollably for hours. And they would describe it as this, that it was like lightning, uh, basically uh, just energy uh, just pumping through their bodies. And some people, uh, you, you know, obviously when they got prayed for, or in, anyways, or they were just standing there worshiping, they would go out in the spirit and they would be gone for hours. In fact, I, I personally witnessed that when, uh, you know, it came time to shut the doors, they would kind of dim the lights, turn them back up, kind of let everybody know, hey, look, it's time to clear the building. It's after 12. And what they would do is somebody would still be on the ground. Their family and friends would come and grab them and kind of just carry them out the building, carry them to their cars. How many of you guys know that's revival, right? So listen, I remember the first time that uh, I went there, uh, my first time I visited the church, that night was baptism night, and they had a, basically a baptism night every week. And I remember sitting there, and, and you know, at, I'm, at this time I'm 18 years old, and I'm sitting there, and they didn't do baptisms uh, a lot of times like you see in church. You know, they get up there, and they just dunk them, and everybody, yay, 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 that's great, okay, awesome. Th- these guys, when, when, when somebody got baptized, they, they, first of all, it was a big baptism pool, and they had uh, about five, six men in the pool with them. And first I was like, what in the world are they doing? 
but the person would come up there and they would put a mic in their face and, and the people would begin to share their testimony. People were talking about, listen, it, it is uh, every race, every age, and they would begin to talk about what God delivered them from. That, you know, if it was from basically from alcohol, if it was from drugs, if it was from, uh, you know, a life of adultery, if it was w- whatever. People, I, m- I remember one guy talking about how he had plans to murder his mother. And God met him. God saved him. <laughs> Crazy, huh? He said, I already laid out the plans. I was going to kill her. And so people give testimony. I remember actually that night a 12-year-old kid getting up there and weeping and talking about how the Lord delivered him from pornography. And so, and so as they would sit there and, and they would give the testimony and... Uh, what God did for life. Of course, the crowd was just celebrating, man. Everybody was just amazed at the power of God. Uh, the, the, let me say it this way the redeeming power of God, the way He was changing people's lives. And then something happened that I'd never seen before. When they would, when they would uh, you know, say, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and they'd baptize them, we know that obviously bearing the old man, for they come up in the new man, the power of God would hit person after person after person and they would begin to shake uncontrollably where the power of God just hit them like a lightning bolt some people just went out and that's why the six guys were up there because they'd have to drag them out of the pool are y'all hearing me good night huh I remember uh, another time I went uh, we were sitting there and, and worship was going on and, and one of the leaders of the church comes up on the platform he grabs the mic and he says this he says God is moving among the children so here's what they did. They, they actually piped the audio from the room that the children were in into the main sanctuary. And all you could hear was kids, little children, wailing and weeping and crying out to God. Little kids. How do you mean you guys know that when a little kid does something, it's not fake? I'm talking about it, it, the, the best way I can describe it, and honestly, words can't really, you know, do it any justice. But, but it was the most holy, God-fearing atmosphere I've ever been in in my life. It was literally like if you had any sin in that moment, you were, you were going to the altar and getting right before God. So there was a thing that kind of uh, marked these meetings, and it, was, and it was this. It was the hunger. In fact, I remember, once again, the first time I went there, when I was standing in line, people weren't just sitting there joking and playing. People were reading their Bible. People were praying. Literally, ch- church starts hours Hours later, and they're already preparing their heart to meet God. They would sit there and they would tell testimonies of what God was doing in their life. They would pray for people. And literally out there in the front lawn of the church, the power of God was hitting people and they were going out. That's fun. Y'all alive tonight? One of the last times I went, though, to the church, I experienced something completely different. Hear this. Uh, My friend Carl and I, some of y'all have met Carl. uh, He and I decided at 1230 at night. We said, hey, man, you want to go to the revival? So we hopped in the car at 1230 at night and drove five hours to the revival so we could go to a Sunday morning service. Like I said, by this time I was 19. You do dumb stuff when you're 19. So we hopped in the car, drove all night, and I remember we slept a little bit. And we got there, and and even though we were really sleepy, we were so pumped and so excited because we we knew that it was going to be worth it, man. God was going to move. I remember we, we got in the church. And, uh, you know, worship started, preaching happened. And I remember just sitting there, uh, honestly, just completely disappointed. I I remember sitting there going, okay, this isn't bad, but this isn't the strong presence that I've experienced in past times. I I I literally remember sitting there and going, you know, uh, basically on the ride home when all was said and done, it was like, okay, we went to a, a typical Sunday morning church service. You know, good praise and worship, good preaching. But, but nothing, once again, out of the extraordinary. In fact, there was no uh, way I could word it, a supernatural outpouring of God's presence. And, and so while we were driving back, I remember sitting there thinking, how in the world can this be? Yeah, I think I'm 19 years old. How in the world can this be? It was the same church building. It was the same worship leader. It was the same pastor, except this time the atmosphere was completely different. Folks, it was that day at 19 years old, I learned a powerful lesson about the kingdom of God. And it's simply this. Here's the lesson. That there's a big difference when people approach God out of tradition and religious duties versus when they approach God with expectation and a genuine hunger. Are y'all with me? The first times I went, the reason God moved is because there was a hunger and an expectation that if that if we begin to worship, we begin to, He's gonna come. When we got there the Sunday morning, and I'm not judging those people, you know, it may have been an off day. I don't know. 
but, but it just felt like that was the Sunday crowd. They were just kind of there to go through the motions. Is anybody with me? I'm sitting there thinking, what is that noise? It's my alarm. That's weird. <laughs> I thought it was you, Christian. I'm not going to lie. I'll repent to you. All right, here we go. <laughs> so watch this. Make it a little bit more relatable. I, I'm like, why is the alarm? I guess I said PM. Maybe that's why I didn't go off this morning. All right. Anybody ever did that? Yeah, it's pretty bad when you're late for work when you did that. Anyways, all right, so watch this. So about five years ago here, uh, we, we had some young men and young women that uh, basically were a part of the school of ministry here at the church, and and they began to have a real uh, hunger for God. They went through a time, if I'm honest, where they were just kind of accumulating knowledge, and it was just kind of for knowledge's sake, and then something happened in the group, and they began to really uh, have a hunger and a passion for Him. And, and, you know, hunger basically means this. It means to have a, a strong or a compelling desire, a stronger, compelling desire. So when I'm talking about this group, the best way I can describe it is this, is that they didn't have a hunger that was for a moment. They didn't have a hunger that was for a pocket of time. They, they, had, a, they had a sustained hunger. Can somebody say sustained hunger? This sustained hunger went beyond a, a Wednesday and beyond a Sunday. This hunger actually began to move to their daily walk with God and their own personal prayer time and their own personal uh, worship time and their own personal time in and, and then it went from there to where these guys actually started getting together and they were going to each other's houses. This is people that all you guys know. They started going to each other's houses and they would sit there uh, for literally hours, four, five, six hours, and they would just worship and pray. And the awesome part was is when it began to move through that school of ministry, it didn't stop there. It actually began to make its way into this ministry, into Destiny Generation. And, and what was so awesome is it became part of the DNA that we have here. Are you all with me tonight? So it, it actually became a key component. It became a core value. If I could say it another way, it became the standard. Are you all hearing me? It became the standard that we are going to be a group of young people that love Jesus and that we're passionate and we're hungry for him. We're hungry for a move of his spirit. So let, let me even maybe transition here and make it a little bit more personal uh, for a lot of you guys. The, the type of uh, of atmosphere that hunger produces some of you guys experienced it last year at summer camp obviously it wasn't the first night if you were there how many guys were there yes no well, I, you know we can all tell you it wasn't the first night because we just came with religious duties second night it was religious duties third night we got hungry for him and what happened that night is 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 what that it was almost prayer kind of just that that anticipation that hunger kind of became worship and then it kind of became ministry time and that's when the glory of god fell can anybody bear witness to that so listen i have been to some unbelievable services but i don't know if i've ever been to a service that was more powerful than that are you hearing me here's what i loved it wasn't because it was watch this it wasn't because there was some great guest speaker it wasn't even a sermon preached. It, it was young people that simply loved Jesus and got hungry for him. And what I love about God is he can't help but to respond to hunger. Amen? So obviously we know the outcome. Listen, if you weren't there, maybe let me, let me throw it out there for you guys like this. That, and I, there's people here that can testify, they can bear witness, all right? That probably, I don't know, 70 to 100 people, it's kind of hard to count when everything's going like that. Uh, 70 to 100 people, the power of God hit them when they went out in the spirit. They look, anybody know the game, pick up sticks? Take sticks and you drop them and they'll go. That's what people look like on the floor. And, and basically, when I'm saying 70 to 100 people look like that probably in about 10 seconds. It was like a bomb went off in the place. And then it kind of continued for, I don't know, probably about two more hours, something like that. It was pretty good. So, anyways, i got to hustle up. This is for foundation sake. So I'm just saying all this because there are certain things that I want you to hear. We'll get to the message here in a minute. All right? You say take your time, but 8.30, we got to roll. Your mama's thinking something different. All right, here we go. So... So li listen, why does God value hunger? If you're taking notes, write these things down. I'm going to go quick, but they'll be on the screen. Why does God value hunger? Number one is this, is because he values relationship. He's relational. Is that true? 
Bottom line is God loves being with us. The Bible says in James 4, 8, it simply says this, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Can't get more simple than that. When you respond to him out of hunger, he is longing. Folks, I'm telling you, he's longing to spend that time with you. Number two is hunger is the way of the kingdom. Hunger is the way of the kingdom. Matthew 5, 6 says this. It says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. What a guarantee, huh? Amen? Amen? Number three, get this, please. Hunger reveals humility and dependency. Hunger reveals humility and dependency. Hum, uh, hunger is really this. It's a positioning of the heart. That's all it is. It's a positioning of the heart. It, it's very hard for a, a, a prideful person that thinks that they can do it all on their own it's very difficult for that person to get hungry for God. In fact, Jesus said it this way. He said, it's hard for a rich man, a person that's dependent upon themselves. He wasn't talking about the amount of money. He was talking about the condition of the heart, that it was hard for them to even, uh, you know, what? It was easier for a camel. What, what's the verse I'm struggling here? To go through the, yeah, to go through the eye of a needle. Good job. Crazy, huh? Watch this verse right here. This is uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 52. It says this, it says, he has filled the hungry, get that, he has filled the hungry with good things. He has filled the humble, the ones who have depended upon him with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. Are y'all with me tonight? Are y'all with me tonight? And the rich he sent away empty. Once again, it's not talking about he punished them because they had money. It's a condition of the heart. Amen? Number four is this. Why does Jesus value or God value hunger? Basically this, just as hunger reveals physical health, it also reveals spiritual health. Just as hunger reveals physical health, it reveals or shows spiritual health. Let me explain. Everybody look up here. You, you know, obviously I got, I got four kids. Hallelujah. The quiver's full in Jesus' name. All right? So we have four kids. And, and I can, because I know my kids... I can look at them, and, and when I see that one of them has lost their appetite, that they're not eating, it's an indicator. It's, a, it's, a, it's an indicator to me that something is not right, that something's wrong, that literally the loss of their appetite is basically a cause for concern. It shows me that they're sick. If you go to people, if you spend any time in a hospital, and also what we do, we spend quite a bit of time in the hospital. When people are dying, people don't want to eat. Are you following me? I remember when my grandmother passed didn't eat for like, I don't know, 15, 20 days, something like that. She just didn't have an appetite. It's an indicator that something's wrong. So watch this. When we say that, that why does God value hunger? Because spiritual hunger basically reveals if you are healthy or not. If you don't have a hunger and appetite for God, it says that you're dying spiritually. Are you hearing me tonight? Yes? No? Talk to me. I know you've been out of it a while, but come on, get with me. Oh, maybe start saying, say, well, all right. Number five, and this is the one we want to talk about tonight. Number five is this, is that hunger releases destiny. Hunger releases destiny. Why does God value hunger? It's because it re he releases destiny through it. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 10. We're going to sit on a portion of Scripture uh, for the rest of the evening. Mark chapter 10. I'm going to start in verse 46. I basically just want to take the next few minutes and show you uh, an example of a guy's life that this happened with. That as he got hungry, God actually revealed his destiny. It's a pretty well-known portion of Scripture. When you get there, say, oh, yeah. If you don't have your Bible, say, oh, no. Y'all ready? Yes, no? Mark 10, verse 46 says this. We're going to read it, and then we'll come back, and we'll work our way through it really slow. Mark 10, 46 says, Now they came to Jericho. As he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. Verse 47. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then many warned him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. 
So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer. Rise, he is calling you. Verse 50. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. 51. So Jesus answered and said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni, Rabbi, teacher, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. Now let's work our way through this. If you're with me, say, Oh, yeah. Verse 46 says, Now they came to Jericho as he went out of Jericho. Now, at first glance, it, it appears that the mention of Jericho in this portion of Scripture is absolutely useless. He went in Jericho, he went out of Jericho. It's not until you take a step back and do you, until you look at basically historical facts about Jericho that you realize that God didn't put the name, the city, Jericho, in there for no reason. How many of you guys know God writes what he means to write? Y'all should have said amen really loud for that one. So basically when you look at some historical facts, you find this, that theologians actually believe this time in Jericho that there was 100,000 people that lived there. Okay? That's basically about a third of our county. Okay? Now, nothing strange about that. But what is strange is this, is that theologians also believe that 25% of the people that lived in Jericho were blind because of poor sanitation. Are you understanding that? So that means that basically that one out of every four individuals were blind. So watch this. We probably have, I don't know, 150, 160 people in here tonight. Let, let's go like this. Dwayne, stand up. Where's Donovan? Donovan, stand up. Help me out. Okay, so here we go. I'm just going to start pointing to some people. Big man with a brave shirt. Stash, stand up. What I got? Four. Here we go. Five, six, seven. Albert, stand up. Eight, nine, ten, eleven. 12 in the back. Stand up. Yes, you. Where am I at? 12? 13, 14, 15, 16. Go ahead. 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. Give us some other people on this side. Uh, Kayla, stand up. Belinda, stand up. Where am I? Help, help me out. Help me out. Austin, stand up. Here we go. Stand up, my man. Where am I at? Somebody give me a number. Where am I at? 30. Stand up. Stand up, stand up. Come on, Walters. Okay, so watch this, okay? Watch this. So can you imagine that every time you came to church, that this everybody that's standing up, and I think we're actually probably a few short. I think I pointed to people they didn't get it. Hosanna, stand up. Help me out. Help me out, help me out, help me out. You in the back, stand up. Come on, stand up. Watch this. So, so that every time you came to church, every time you came in this room, these people were in here begging because they're blind. That wasn't meant to be funny. <laughs> so watch this. Watch this. Take, take a serious note. Watch this. So out of the 100,000 people that lived in Mexico, 25,000 of them were blind. Let's multiply that in this city. That means that about 75,000 people would be on the road begging. Just for food, just for money, hoping that they can live. Are you hearing what I'm saying tonight? Can, can, if you can just imagine in your mind, how overwhelming would that be? It would be almost like you couldn't go anywhere without somebody pulling at you, asking you, give me something, give me something, give me something. Are you all with me tonight? Yes? So watch this. Stay standing. So the un, unique fact about this portion of Scripture isn't that Jesus had an encounter with a blind man. That's not what's unique about this. There was 25,000 of them. But what is unique is how this particular blind man, how he approached Jesus. Watch this. It's obvious that he wasn't looking for a handout. Now, we know according to the portion of Scripture, he was looking for healing. But if you give me grace, I would like to suggest this, that he was desiring something more. I personally believe that he was desiring for his destiny to be revealed. Sit down. Let me explain this to you. You think... Pastor Quinn, that's weird. Watch this. It says that they went in Jericho, they came out of Jericho, watch this, with his disciples in a great multitude, and a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus. Somebody say Bartimaeus. The name Bartimaeus is, is basically, uh, co- it's a combination of two words. The first one, B-A-R, Bar, and then Timaeus. Now, Bar simply means this. It means son of. Son of. So Bartimaeus means son of Timaeus. 
It's just basically acknowledging him. It's tagging him to his father. It's no different than, uh, you know, there's some people in here tonight, their last name's Johnson. Johnson means the son of John. If someone's name is here Richardson, it's the son of Richard. Easy facts. Some of y'all got the greatest revelation of your life right there. That was amazing. So, so when, once again, so when we say Bartimaeus is the son of Timaeus, now we have to look to get a full meaning of what this guy's name means. What does Timaeus mean? Y'all listen up. Timaeus means this. It means honor. It means honor. So when you put those together, Bartimaeus, the name Bartimaeus means son of honor. So what is our son of honor? What's our son of value? Our son of great worth? What is he doing? It says that, what? That he sat by the road begging. Are y'all hearing me tonight? Yes, no? He sat by the road begging. I don't know about you, but I don't think begging is too honorable. Wave your hand at me if you agree. I don't think begging is honorable. In fact, I think I'm willing to step out on a limb and, and say this, that this guy was living below his God-given destiny. None of honor is begging. He's living below his destiny. Now watch, some people probably think that's unfair, uh, especially when you do a little bit more research, you realize that theologians believe that Timaeus' his father was blind as well. So here you have, you have a city, Jericho, that the blind are literally reproducing the blind. Can I maybe stretch it a little further and say this, that this city had almost, basically this, they've almost, um, basically they've embraced a culture where it was acceptable to live below the God-given destiny, to live below the God standard. Is anybody with me? So, because here's the deal. If you and I went to a city like that and we saw 75,000 people or 25,000 people, sorry, uh, literally begging for money, how many of you guys know that that would be really weird? Yes? I know people that have went to India and literally where there's little kids that are crippled and twisted up that are sitting in the median and literally the traffic is so close that when they're going, they're sitting there in the little camel cart deal and uh, the donkey cart, whatever it is, and somebody's pulling on them. Because it's a little kid begging that's bones twisted asking for money. That's culture shock. But for some reason, these people in Jericho, what, was, what is uncommon became common. It became normal. Are you hearing me tonight? Let, let, me maybe, let me try to see if I can make that maybe land home a little better. You go to school on you know, Monday and you find out so-and-so slept with somebody. And you go, well, that's normal. It's not normal. It's sin. Are you hearing me? Oh, so-and-so, he's just doing drugs. That's not normal. Are you following me? There, there, there comes a time, it's, it's, it's like this. It's like you move into a town and, and there's five prostitutes on the corner. And you go, every day you drive by them. Jesus, save them. Jesus, give them value. Jesus, give them worth. Three, four, five months later, you, you don't even realize they're there. What is uncommon is now common. You, you, you actually grow uh, immune to it. So these people had grown immune to living below the standard, the divine rights, the divine blessing that God put on their life. Are you with me? So let's look at how Bartimaeus approached Jesus. Verse 47, watch this. It says, and when he heard, somebody say he heard. I got a friend that says, you heard? (laughs) And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth. I love that. When he heard. Here's this guy. Obviously, the only thing he could do is hear and feel. But he has obviously heard stories of what Jesus can do. Yeah? He's heard. He's heard the stories, the testimonies of what Jesus had done. News traveled back then, yes? Just because they didn't have the internet and, tech, and uh, cell phones don't mean it didn't. It stopped. It still moved. So watch this. It goes on to say, And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to crowd all the more. Watch this. Jesus, son of David. Somebody say, son of David. This is really important because that means that basically whatever he heard, whatever news he heard, he came to know and believe that Jesus was the Messiah because that was a title that was given to the Messiah, son of David. There was only one son of David, and it's Jesus. Do you understand? Let me, let me break it down for you if you don't know what it means. Yes, Messiah means the anointed one, blah, 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 all that, but it, but it means this. He's basically saying that you are God. You are God. You are God. 
You understand that? that he, so this is, this is where if you and I are going to walk in what God's called us walk, we got to realize he's God. And, and the crazy part to me about this is this, is I think this guy knew that this was possibly his one chance. One chance for change. One. Are you hearing me? Let, 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 me, let, me, maybe, let me maybe throw it down to you like this. If you knew Jesus was coming back on Friday, how would you have acted tonight? What kind of desperation would you would have you brought to church? To church. Are y'all hearing me? Yes, no? Okay, let's be honest here really quick because we're family. How many of you guys said, man, I probably did things a little different tonight? Come on, lift your hand high. Lift your hand high. Amen. So, maybe me too. I rebuke myself. <laughs> so, watch this. So it says, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. I love what the Amplified says. It actually says this. It says, Jesus, Son of David, have pity and mercy on me now. One chance. And then it goes on to say this. It says that, Many warned him or many severely rebuked him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more. It means he got louder. He says, Son of David, have mercy on me. Remember what we said hunger means. Hunger means this. It means a strong. Somebody says to me, say a strong. Say a strong. Can you say it strong? A strong or compelling. Oh, that was weak. Or compelling desire. Here's the point that I want to make to you through this. So here comes Jesus. He hears that it's Jesus. He recognizes who he is, and he begins to cry out with desperation. So here's something that you need to know about hunger. Hunger has a motivating factor to it. Hear that. Not my kid. (laughs) Hunger has a motivating factor to it. Now, here's what I mean by that. That hunger doesn't have room for passivity. It doesn't just sit back and accept things the way they are. Are you with me tonight? This is for somebody here. Hunger motivates us to step out of our comfort zone and out of our convenience. It causes us to move out of what seems safe and secure into something greater. It causes us to step out into what God really has for our lives. Amen? Amen? I want you to notice something here. And I'm saying this for a reason. That Bartimaeus could have been sitting there that day. He heard that it was coming through. And he could have, he could have just thought, you know what? There's... 24,999 other blind people begging around here. Why should I do anything different? Hear me, please. He could sit there and say, you know what? After all, you know, I'm, I'm surviving. I'm doing okay. He, he could have sit there and said, you know what? But besides, there's 24,999 other young people in the city, the city, living below God's divine destiny for their lives. Why should I dream that it could be any different for me? Are you hearing me tonight? Are you hearing me tonight? The reason you can dream is because you were born for greater things. The reason you can dream is because you were born for honor. Yes? See, see, the reason I think that this guy maybe had a little bit more gumption than the other people is because he realized what his name meant. He realized that God, check this out, that culture, just so you know, today we make up names. All right, let, let, I wish I could tell you some, but that's too bad. All right, it, it'd be awful. But literally, I mean, we make up words and we name people now, okay? I don't get it, okay? Then these people, name, they named their children intentionally. There was a purpose behind it. So they didn't just name him Bartimaeus just to name him Bartimaeus. They named him because they were prophetically declaring over his life, you are a son of honor. Are you hearing me tonight? When we went and named our own children, I'll go this route. When we named our own children, uh, we, we prayed, get this, for months. God, what do you want to name them? What do you want to name them? What do you want to name them? Because I personally believe, and you can think we're crazy, it's fine, but that every time I speak my child's name, I am prophesying their destiny over them. That's why my little girl, Michaela, it means one who resembles God. Her middle name, Victory of the People. Are you with me? My son, my firstborn son, Caden, means friend. The Lord spoke to me and said he's going to be a friend of God. So his middle name means victory. The next one, Jude, praise. Alexander, defender of man. 
The last one, Owen, it means young, noble, warrior. Luke means bringer of light. And to top it all off, our last name, I have to tell you this because it's so cool. Some of y'all have heard it, but I think it's awesome. You go self. <sighs> That's awful. Thought it for years. Did a little research. That's me. I'm nerdy, I guess. Self came from, it's Viking. <laughs> it's kind of manly. So it, it comes from Seawolf. Seawolf. I'm Pastor Seawolf. So, <laughs> and it means this. One who has built his life upon a rock. Who's Jesus? I'll take it, Lord. He's the rock. Amen. So watch this. So I think that the reason this guy didn't want to be like 24,999 other people is because he realized that he was born for greater things. He was born to be a son of honor. Now, here's the question I have for some of us tonight. How long will we, born again, spirit-filled believers in this room, y'all listen, how long will we allow the culture... How long will we allow people's opinions, people's thoughts, people's words, people's judgment determine if we will fulfill our destiny or not? Yes? No, no, look, let's just get down real with it, okay? Most of you guys in here, you go to a public school, Christian school, or private school of some sort. There's a few of you guys that are homeschooled. So, listen, if you can be honest with yourself... How many of you guys think that if it wasn't for the group of people that surrounded you at school, that you would live different? Are you hearing what I'm saying? That if it really wasn't for that group, that, man, I'd probably be a little bit more in love with Jesus. I'd probably be a little bit more open. If that's the case, and listen, I know there's people that aren't really, I wouldn't ask you to raise their hand because I think most people in here could probably give acknowledgement of that somehow, in some way, then, then ultimately you are living below your destiny. Amen? That just like Bartimaeus there where they told him to be quiet, people have silenced you too long. Amen? This is something that I've been praying over myself and my children. I've actually been asking God that that, uh, we would have a hunger greater than what other people think is necessary. That I want my passion for Him to be greater than what the normal Christian think is necessary. So look at what happened when Bartimaeus decided to step out of his comfort zone. Remember, that motivating factor that comes with hunger. Verse 49, I love this. Probably my favorite part of this entire portion of Scripture. Verse 49 simply says this. So Jesus stood still. Okay, Pastor, what does that mean? It means this. It means that his hunger calls the unstoppable God to stop dead in his tracks, to turn around and give him his undivided attention. See, there was something that happened at camp. I didn't say this earlier. We were there. The best way I could put language to what happened at camp is when we began to pray and we began to worship, that we literally pulled on heaven until that atmosphere became this atmosphere. So when he sat there and he cried out, Son of David, have mercy on me, he pulled on heaven. And what happened? Heaven stood still. So I'm going to ask you the question, when's the last time that your hunger caused the unstoppable God to stop dead in his tracks and to give you his undivided attention? Listen, 25,000 people, one got his attention. Don't think for a second that he won't, he won't hear you when you pray. Are you hearing me? Watch this. I, I wasn't going to share this, but it, it fits so well here. Going back to the top when I told you I went to that, that outpouring, that, that revival. There was a, a time there in that two-year span that I was dating this young lady. She loved Jesus. We were both Christians. Nothing was going wrong. I, I was, you know, preaching, doing, doing the whole bit, you know. And, um, but I felt very unsettled in my heart. And I felt like, man, I, I, you know, God, is this you? Is it not you? You, you, know, you know how it is. You get attached and you give them your heart and, you, and all that. And the Lord's just boring a hole in you. Going, you know what, you, you, you're missing it, son. And so watch this. So I go down to that revival that millions, mil, get that millions of people went to. And I remember we got there. And the first thing I did is I threw my Bible and my stuff in the seat. And I went down the altar on the right side. And I knelt down in the steps and I said, God, if it is not your will for me to be with this girl, God, I don't care whatever you got to do today. Speak to me and let me know. 
And I prayed probably five minutes. I got up, went to my seat, didn't think much about it. We worshiped. The pastor got up. He started preaching, the evangelist. And about midway through his he stops and he begins to talk about a young man that's with a young lady that he don't supposed to be with. And basically that you need to cut it off. You need to da 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 And then he talks that five, ten minutes. He goes, I, I don't know why I said that. I just felt like I needed to. So get this, guys. Hold up. Get this. Many people, he heard me. He stopped us a revival service to tell me, son, you need to back out of that. I love you too much. Don't do it. Are you hearing me tonight? Are you hearing me tonight? Watch this. It says, so Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man. Once again, one out of 25,000. Saying to him, be of good cheer. Rise, he is calling you. I don't have time, but just think about this. Isn't it funny how people have changed their tomb when they notice God's hands on your life? So what did Bartimaeus do? Y'all got to get this. Watch this. If you didn't get anything tonight, get this, please. We're about to end, okay? I'm going longer than I wanted to. Verse 50 says, And throwing aside, remember Jesus said, Come. They said, Get up. He's calling you. It says, And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. You need to understand tonight that that garment represented his identity. Somebody say identity. It's who he was. It was his beggar's robe. Are you following me tonight? Yes, no. That literally, that here's Bartimaeus. He is realizing that if he was going to embrace his God-given identity as a son of honor, he couldn't keep holding on to that dishonoring, disempowering, uh, devaluing, self-degrading identity he had been wearing all of his life. Watch this. That he had to throw aside his old identity so he could receive his new one. You can't carry two identities. You hear me? Y'all been trying too long. It ain't going to work, y'all. You, you, listen, you, you can't carry an identity while you're at school. And then carry an identity when you get to church and bless God, highly favored, bless, hallelujah. And then go to home and, and have another identity. You only got one. He ain't called you to be schizophrenic. Amen? Watch this. 51. So Jesus answered and said to him, what do you want me to do for you? He called him, come here, what do you want me to do for you? I read that and I go, that's got to be one of the stupidest questions ever asked. He's a blind guy, what do you think? But listen, when you know the heart of God, you know that really wasn't a stupid question. Because Jesus was really asking him this, and I want you all to understand this. Bartimaeus, do you want more than just a handout? Watch this, y'all listen. Do you want something different than the rest of your generation? That's a question for you tonight. Do you want something different than the rest of your generation? Do you want to become who I've called you to be? Are you sure you really want to change? Watch this. The blind man said to him, Teacher, here's what he asked for, that I may receive my sight. What was he saying? Once again, he's a son of honor, right? Destined, declared, prophetically over his life. I'm a son of honor. And here he is, he's blind, dishonorable. He's begging. And he goes, I want to receive my sight. What was he asking at the heart of it? He was saying, Jesus, I want to receive my destiny. I want to receive honor. I want to receive value. I want to receive worth. Are you hearing me tonight? It says, verse 52, Then Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith, your hunger has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. I, I want you to know tonight that God, get this, that God reserves transformation for the hungry. That God reserves, He holds back transformation for the hungry. Why? Because it takes humility. Amen? It's not for the passive, it's not for the proud, it's for those who are humble and hungry in their heart. So, what does this mean for us? Okay, and we've got to land this thing. The Bible says that you and I are different than blind Bartimaeus. Because the Bible tells us revelation. Everybody looking at me. We're almost done. It says this, that we are blind, naked, poor, and wretched. Yes? And that literally at one time or another, without him, you and I were wandering aimlessly without hope, without a purpose. We were living below our God-given destiny. We were nothing more than beggars. 
The Bible also says this, like Bartimaeus, God has called you and I to be sons and daughters of honor. Sons and daughters of value, sons and daughters of worth. How do I know that? Because simply the Bible says that his kingdom is the kingdom of honor. I also understand that because he is an honorable king and he's called me to be his kid, right? So if I'm his son, how is he going to be as an honorable king, make me a dishonorable son? It doesn't work that way. The Bible, in fact, says this in Ephesians 2.10. It says, for we are his workmanship. We are his work of art. It says, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Somebody say good works. The good works there in the Greek language means this. It means honorable works. I don't know about you, but when I meet somebody that does honorable works, they typically are an honorable person. So God created you to be an honorable person. Amen. If we can, let's just stand to our feet. Let me help you out. Good works means honorable actions, and honorable actions are done by honorable people. Everybody listen really quick. We're almost done. Here's the last one. Once again, just like Bartimaeus, God desires, y'all get this, please. God desires to do whatever it is from our lives that robs us from our honor. Are y'all hearing me? In fact, let's do this really quick. Let's close our eyes. I want to help you here. Kind of block out everybody around you. I know there's a lot of good-looking people in here tonight. Darnell said, quit looking at him. He can't help it. Look at Jesus. Listen, God desires to remove whatever it is from your life that robs you of your honor. He desires to remove that which makes you dishonorable and disempowered but you got to get this no different than Bartimaeus the only way that this can happen is if you approach him with hunger and humility hunger and humility once again out of your hunger your destiny is released remember what I said about those school of ministry students who are they it's Pastor Josh it's Pastor Cameron it's Pastor Thomas it's Sam it's a whole gang load of those guys Mooney Uh, There's a whole bunch of them around here. I literally watched them as they got hungry for him. Once again, God opened the doors of heaven, and he released his destiny and his plan for their lives. And he wants to do the same for you today. But you got to come to him, and you got to throw off an old identity and pick up the one he really has for you. Listen, the Bible says this in Proverbs 18, 12, last verse. It says, and before honor is humility. So all eyes closed, please.